Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and dear uh, colleagues from abroad. Um, let me introduce uh, the speaker for today, uh, who is Anthony Allen. Uh, Anthony is sound engineer whose homeland is Scotland, but now he lives in Prague. Uh, he works in a team of Philip Scheer, uh, who were there some weeks ago, and you may remember him. Uh, Anthony is a kind of inseparable part of a Novi Phonograph project, uh, where he works from 2018. Uh, and uh, his work uh, includes uh, digital transfer of the uh, recordings and related activities. Uh, Anthony also plays uh, the double bass uh, in the Prague Film Orchestra, which I find very interesting. And uh, he also composes the music. So, as you heard, uh, the sound flows through whole his life and work. Thank you now, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Helena. Uh, so I'm not actually the speaker for today. I'm here to introduce our speakers, but um, it was a very nice introduction. Um, so welcome to Block Expertu. I know you have these very frequently, and um, today's is about digital preservation, um, audiovisual preservation particularly, uh, but a lot of the concepts are transferable. Uh, if you're not familiar with digital preservation, I've asked our main speakers to give you a slight introduction uh, my view on it is it's, it's a very complicated task, but it can be explained very simply, and that is keeping, keeping files alive. Uh, once you've digitized something, what do you do with it? What do you do with the file? You have to put it in a repository, you have to describe it, you have to constantly change the repository so that that repository doesn't die, uh, so the servers don't go down and so on. So it's all about keeping the files usable for the future, and um, how to do that best. How do we, if we're preserving a, an object in a digital form, we're already losing some of the, the object itself, and we have to try and uh, get the best representation of that in a digital form, and then preserve it for the future. So that's uh, um, the crash course. Um, so, yeah, as I, as I was introduced, I work at the Chess Game Museum Hudby, as a sound engineer for Novi Phonograph. Um, and today I'm here to welcome preservation experts from AVP. Um, AVP is AV Preserve. It's a consultancy and software development firm from America that specializes in audiovisual um, documents and repositories and working a lot with museums, libraries. Uh, some of their biggest uh, customers include Library of Congress, the Dutch Center for Sound and Vision, the FBI, um, New York Public Library, one of the biggest libraries, if not the biggest in the world. Library of Congress might compete for that. Um, so the team here today, we have uh, Sean Averkamp and Pamela Wisner. Uh, Pamela is a specialist in collection management and digitization workflow, among other things. I know they have a lot of hats that they wear. Um, and Sean is more leaning towards, although uh, well, she's more leaning towards the software development side of things, so data models and various scripting uh, solutions. I'm sure they'll tell us more. Um, and I have to say, sorry, but there's been a change in the lineup. Bert was supposed to be here today, Bert Lyons, um, but he's had to fly uh, early this morning after presenting in Prague yesterday. So instead, we have the very competent uh, Sean and Pamela. Um, and the, the whole point of this block is because if you're an archivist in the 21st century, you, you're you not uh, messing around with little catalog uh, cards. You're, you have a new digital challenge and you have to understand technology at a fundamental level um, to be able to do your job. So for those of you who will be graduating as digital curators, um, you will start seeing new job adverts popping up for a digital pr preservation specialist, for a systems librarian, whatever that is, and a digital and preservation archivist. 
And so all of this IT-centric knowledge as well as the abstract archival thinking is very essential to doing your job. Um, so in Sean and Pamela, you see the combination of those skill sets and they, they cover the whole range of IT and uh, archival knowledge. Um, so during this session, I would really like you to think about what skills you're developing. Um, if you're focusing too much on the archival side, perhaps you should start thinking about how a computer works, how does a storage system work, um, how do networks work, and what happens when you transfer something over a network. Is it going to be a perfect copy? Sometimes, most of the time, but not always. Um, so for today's event, we have three intentionally open-ended questions, which they will answer together, um, and possibly offering different perspectives based on their expertise. So the first one, first question is, what are the most useful skills digital curators are about to develop? So we're looking near future, maybe the scripting. Scripting definitely pops up on a lot of job adverts. Um, number two would be how to introduce new trends in preservation technologies to more conservative memory institutions. Um, and most of that stems from a lack of technical know-how. So if you go to the director of a municipal library and you say, oh, can we get this new server system put in? He's going to say, why? We have more shelf space than we need, or something along those lines. And the third one is, what are the biggest challenges memory institutions are facing, apart from funding, in the area of long-term preservation, which is digital preservation for the long term? Um, so. We will have some time at the end, hopefully, to uh, answer your questions. So please think of some questions. Uh, they just if you hear anything along this, uh, any, anything related to your degree, or anything you hear during this talk, um, please raise your hand. And um, I guess I'll now pass you over to New York, Brooklyn. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Pamela and Sean. Hands together. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, uh, we, are, we are very happy to be today with you. Um, we are thankful for the, for, for the invitation. Um, thanks to Anthony and Philip for making this happen and thanks to technology that allows us to be here with you today uh, in your afternoon in our morning here in New York. Um, so we have called this uh, preservation, uh, sorry, this presentation, digital preservation in the real world. Um, when we saw the questions that you sent us, um, we tried, we had conversations here at the office and thinking about um, answers to those questions. And most of them, of course, come from um, our experience in, um, in the professional field uh, in very, very different areas and working with different organizations. Um, both uh, in ADD, but also in our previous uh, experience or previous jobs. Um, so we hope that uh, this presentation um, has, you know, useful information that comes from all this uh, various uh, background that we have. Um, like Anthony said, we have um, here at ADD um, very different uh, skills. Um, we all do a lot of different things. We work with, like I said, uh, different organizations. So we do different things for organizations. Uh, and all those uh, skill sets are, are very useful in our work. Um, and so we hope that this presentation is going to be helpful, helpful to you as you continue developing your professional path uh, and, and also in understanding uh, a little bit more about digital preservation beyond uh, the actual um, actions of digital preservation. And uh, Anthony mentioned a little bit uh, what digital preservation is, um, but sort of to, to uh, round it a little bit, um, digital preservation is of course trying to um, secure access and um, in, the, in the long term to our digital assets, right? And the point of digital, and in order to do that in digital preservation, um, we need to, first of all, secure the deeds um, and also organize our assets and making sure they are accessible in the long term, but also making sure that these operations are sustainable. So a lot of digital preservation is not really related to um, the actual technology 
but how we organize ourselves around being representation as an organization, how we structure um, our workflows, how we structure our organizations to ensure video preservation um, in the long term. So, um, so we have tried to answer these questions um, and we, ha we have proposed um, you know, a few specific topics for each of these questions, but um, at the end, we want to open to your questions um, and, and hope that these answers in a way um, encourage conversation between us. So it, it's really great that we actually have the opportunity to talk directly uh, to you and actually see you, although we see you very, uh, very small there in the camera. Um, but it's, it's really great that we can have that conversation. So we'll, we'll have some space for that at the end. Um, so uh, I think uh, now we want to introduce ourselves a little bit, um, give you a little bit more uh, information about our background so you understand uh, where we come from. Um, so I am Pamela Wiesner. Um, I am uh, originally trained as an audio engineer. Um, and so my first introduction to, to the world of preservation was through audio. So I worked, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Chile and I worked um, at organizations, institutions in Chile, mostly doing uh, audio preservation um, and analog, right? So a lot of digitization and figuring out workflows for digitization. Um, and then I came to the US to study um, at the New York uh, University at the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program. So um, I wanted to de develop a little bit more uh, skills related to um, audiovisual preservation. So a little, be a little bit beyond audio. Uh, so I graduated from that master's program and then um, I worked here for a few independent organizations and I went back to Chile um, a couple of years later. And in Chile, I, I worked at the university, the National University teaching a uh, course on digital preservation specifically for audio engineers. Um, so um, I have some experience teaching as well uh, in Chile. Um, and back in Latin America, I also um, started working as a consultant um, in, in different um, countries in Latin America, um, mostly Colombia, Chile and Colombia. Uh, with one um, with what colleague that was from Colombia. Um, so I also have a lot of experience in um, coming up with projects and um, working independently uh, as an archivist. Um, so not only the perspective of being part of an organization, but also how you work with an organization uh, as a consultant. Um, and I started working at ADD um, I think in 2017, so it's, it's been about two years that I've been here uh, at ADP. Um, and I worked in different, very different projects, um, doing assessment for um, physical collections, but also software development projects, uh, digital preservation, uh, system selection, et cetera. So uh, like I said, at ADP, we have a, a very uh, set of skills um, and we work with a lot of organizations at the same time. So we have multiple projects um, running at the same time. So um, I do uh, a little bit of uh, everything uh, here at ADP. Um, and so that's where I am right now. Um, I, can, I can give it to Sean so she can introduce herself. Thanks, yeah, so I'm Sean Abercamp and um, I've been with ADP for about a year now. Um, I came here uh, on a, a bit of a different path than Pamela. So I was, I was trained as a digital librarian. So I attended library school um, and took a very focused um, track for digital librarianship. And one great part of that was I got to work on um, a lot of different digital projects within the, the university library uh, where I did my, uh, my degree. Um, and there I got a lot of experience working on digital humanities projects, digitization projects, learning about metadata. Um, and from there, I took a couple of different um, jobs at university libraries, um, working as a metadata librarian, um, working as a data services librarian, and then heading up um, a research and, and publishing unit, digital research and publishing unit um, at the library. And there I learned a lot about the different parts of um, the digital um, asset and data life cycle. So, you know, working with um, very, you know, like production level 
projects where you have a collection, you want to digitize it, you want to make it accessible, to working with faculty members on special projects. So, you know, working with them on their, the conception of their idea for digitization to support a research project, to guiding that process of digitization and helping them make that available, to working with research data, um, helping faculty at a university um, plan um, to um, make their data accessible and to help preserve it. Um, I also, uh, let's see, did a lot with um, metadata, so worked on some data migration projects, so not just creating metadata, but supporting metadata throughout the digital life cycle, so a lot of metadata cleanup, metadata maintenance, um, and eventually that brought me to the New York Public Library about uh, six years ago. I spent about five years there working as the manager of the metadata services unit, where we uh, worked on the production um, and maintenance of metadata, but also um, I worked within NYPL Labs, which did some um, research and development work. So we did some experimental and innovative uh, projects with digital assets after they've been created. So really just exploring, you know, what the possibilities are. And um, this is um, all of these different experiences with data and digital assets has really informed my view of digital preservation as a very holistic and life cycle focused practice. Um, it's not just, um, you know, storing and saving the bits after it's completed. It's thinking about um, preservation and um, how we provide access to assets for the long term from the very start. So when you're planning a project, when you're creating workflows for digitization, when you're thinking about what metadata you want to associate with the digital asset, um, having a goal and having a view of what digital preservation is going to look like at every point in that life cycle is very, very important. That's kind of guided me in the work that I've done. Um, so now I work um, with Pamela and um, many, Bert and many other folks here at AVP and um, work on some consulting projects um, around data asset management, but I've done a lot with um, software development, um, working on some research and development projects with clients, so helping them take a, um, you know, an idea that they have and help them create a prototype or a pilot so that they can uh, try to build something innovative within their own organization. Um, and yeah, a, a lot of what I'd call like data janitor work. So really doing, helping people do the work of sustaining and maintaining their data and their digital assets for the long term. Um, so yeah, I'm also very excited to talk to you today and um, we will start addressing the questions that uh, you posed to us. And we did take them a little out of order. So I hope you don't mind. Um, but yeah, so we hope that you'll think of some questions as we're um, walking through this and um, really give us some good uh, questions that may even stump us at the end. So I'll pass this back over to Pamela and she's gonna kick us off here. Yes, thank you, Sean. Um, so uh, another thing that we forgot to say is that we, we also both teach at uh, NYU, at New York University. Um, Sean teaches a, um, a metadata course. Um, I, I don't. I don't know the the official name of the metadata course. I think uh, it's just called metadata. It just metadata. <laughs> <laughs> that says it all. Um, and uh, I teach uh, digital literacy uh, and also collection management. So um, we also have some um, educational experience. Experience. Um, and we also forgot to tell you a little bit more about AVP, um, about our company. So Anthony mentioned a few um, of our clients. Um, so we, we are um, a, a consulting firm that does uh, a lot of work with uh, data management in general. And so that's, that's pretty uh, broad. We, we work with data uh, at many different levels. Uh, we work with organizations that are both small and large. So yes, uh, we, we do work We, so for example, one of our clients is a library of Congress, that's a huge organization, but um, we also work with small organizations. For example, um, very recently we had a project uh, on digital preservation for the Brooklyn Historical Society. So um, we not only work with big organizations, we have worked with um, broadcasters as well, also both, uh, 
private and public um, sound and vision. So we work internationally. So sound and vision is another one of our past clients. Uh, we work a lot with universities. Um, so we've done uh, work for uh, University of Maryland, um, Indiana University, for example. We also work with corporations. Uh, some of them we can uh, say their names. So we, we also work with uh, large corporations. Um, and type of uh, things that we do, um, a lot of assessments and planning of uh, very various types. So uh, assessment of, of physical collections, but also digital preservation assessment and, and planning for moving towards, for example, digital preservation, uh, sustainable digital preservation programs. Um, we also work um, doing uh, system selection, uh, so helping organizations um, define uh, specific requirements uh, for their systems, and that could be a digital preservation system, but it could be a different type of system. So uh, we start from the, um, from the basis that uh, we first define those, um, those requirements, and then we see what kind of system is appropriate. Uh, and then we also help organizations through the process of implementation uh, of those uh, systems. Uh, and we also do software development, both uh, custom software development, but we also have our own um, tools. And if you go to the website, there are a few of our tools that are open source um, and free. Uh, so um, uh, if you want to check it out, we have a couple um, tools uh, that are specific for digital preservation as well. Um, so that's us. And I think we, uh, we can get started with the questions now. That was a long introduction, but I think it's uh, uh, good information for you to understand where um, our answers come from. So um, we can go to the next slide. So this is the first question that we will address. Um, what are the biggest challenges memory institutions are facing aside from funding in the area of long-term preservation? Um, and so um, the first answer to this question would be, uh, select uh, a type of storage and storage management. Um, and this is very broad, so I'll explain a little bit more. Um, so when we talk about um, applications, when we, when we say uh, type of storage and storage management, we are talking about applications and system, uh, systems that allow you to manage digital, digital assets uh, very broadly. Um, so the, the challenge with this part is that there are many options out there. There are many systems out there that do a lot of different things. Uh, they have different features. Um, and there is not one single answer to this. Um, there is not one, uh, one size, size fits all. Um, so it's, it's very important that uh, before um, engaging in the process of uh, selecting uh, storage and selecting a management for that storage or whatever that system is, um, you first need to think about what you want to do with that system. And that's going to give you um, a clue on um, what direction to take. Um, because it can be very overwhelming to, uh, to see all the options that are available. And so um, one of the biggest challenges in, in terms of selecting storage and storage management uh, is number one cost. And I know that uh, in the question says, aside from funding, uh, but it's not just the fact of uh, knowing how much it's going to cost. So you have to look at costs from different angles. It's not just the price per terabyte. Um, it's, uh, it, it's all the different, um, all the different uh, actors, all the different um, things that are uh, related to storage. Um, that may cost you money. So for example, for management, uh, systems do not manage themselves. Uh, who is going to be responsible for managing that storage, right? Um, the, someone's going to have to um, be responsible for um, the management system too, right? Um, so there are a lot of different um, uh, things that are involved in determining the cost for storage and storage management that are not necessarily just the actual storage. Um, another thing to consider for this is um, users' needs. Like I said, uh, you need to define your requirements. And some of those requirements are going to be associated to your actual users. And we, when we talk about users, uh, we're not only talking about external users, but also internal users. 
So if this is a digital preservation system, most likely uh, the people who will interact with the system will be internal users, right? So managers or people who are actually ingesting data to the system, right? Um, so you do need to see um, first um, what their needs are, uh, how they expect to interact with the, with the, um, the system, right? Um, and you also have to think about maintenance, right? So like I said, it's not just the price per terabyte, but also how we are going to uh, keep the system going in the in the long term, right? Um, so uh, are there any routine maintenance uh, actions that need to happen? Uh, and that probably is going to influence cost as well. Um, or for example, other things like, um, your system is your system going to store only information are you going to pull information from your system and those are things that can also uh, include some additional costs so those are those are things to consider so not only how you're going to uh, bring um, uh, content to your system but also how you're going to bring it back if you need to right so those are some of the things to consider um, another challenge uh, of these aspects, so if this, this, this can be, um, uh, and I think, in, yeah, I'm still uh, talking about storage. <laughs> so, yeah. um, another um, thing to consider when selecting uh, storage and uh, storage systems is how uh, compatible the new systems will be with your existing system. So let's say that you have um, a um, cataloging system, for example, uh, how would that interact with your storage system or maybe not? Uh, so those are things that you need to consider. Uh, how the data models match, if they don't, then what's what uh, the mapping is going to be. So um, you need to think about what you already have in place uh, and how this new system is gonna be integrated because um, it, it cannot be disruptive, right? Uh, you know, we have to think about um, the full environment when bringing a new system in. Um, and also thinking about how it fits with current workflows. Uh, so for example, digitization workflows that you have in place, um, data acquisition workflows, so how you get information from um, donors, for example, or if you create uh, information internally, then how is that going to go um, to the storage, so thinking about the whole cycle of uh, data and your assets. Uh, and also uh, planning for growth, uh, that's another challenge. So you have, because we're talking about digital preservation, we're not just talking about a system for the next five or 10 years, we're thinking long-term, right? So 20, 50 years, right? So um, how, um, how we expect our collections to grow. Um, and this is also related to uh, being able to um, select the content that uh, you will um, preserve for the long term. You need to, you need to be selective, and we'll talk about that in um, in uh, I think one of the uh, following questions. But that's an important thing to consider. Um, so no matter what, like you can see, um, storage and storage management is a big decision, and it has many variables. So um, that's why um, it's, it's one big challenge for um, organizations and professionals. Um, so now we can go to the next one. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so uh, the next answer to this question is um, defining governance and creating policies and documentation. Um, so, uh, Digital preservation, like we said at the beginning, is not only about the actual technology and the actual bits and preserving those bits to the long term. Um, it's, it's a lot about um, organization and a lot about people. Um, so this, this part of the um, process maybe doesn't require a lot of um, financial resources, but believe me, it is the hardest one. Um, so uh, bringing people together uh, to actually figure out how, um, what the governance is going to be for your system uh, and what the policies will be and how to document those policies can be a, a huge, huge uh, challenge. Um, and why it's so hard? Uh, because um, this process of uh, creating governance must include all stakeholders. 
uh, because we have to make sure that the system is uh, works for everybody, right? And um, covers the needs of all the system users. Uh, we need, for example, people uh, from the high up uh, because we need to know their vision. Uh, we need to know which direction we're going. Um, if, if it's, for example, a museum, where, where do we expect that we'll be in 10, 20 years? So the system needs to be um, aligned with, those, with that vision and that direction. Um, we also need to bring in all the people who will interact with the technology. Um, and also sometimes people who will not interact directly with the technology, but they can bring uh, some uh, useful information uh, for the process. For example, uh, people who interact with, uh, directly with users. Um, uh, so they know exactly what, uh, what type of information they're looking for, how they are looking for information. Um, so that gives us a, a good idea of the whole life cycle of data and, and, and assets, right? Um, and also uh, helps us establish uh, governance uh, realistically because it's based on um, the activities that we uh, currently uh, carry out our, organi at our organization. Um, also, it's a challenge because it requires uh, advocacy uh, because you want to generate internal buy-in. So when you talk about digital preservation, sometimes it's not really um, a very hot topic because uh, you know you say, we want to preserve the deep forever and they're gonna be in storage. Uh, so how is that <laughs> sexy, right? Uh, but you need to advocate for that um, and, it's, and it's not easy. Um, so sometimes you need to convince some people that um, do not fully understand um, what digital preservation is, but maybe uh, they also don't understand what their um, position is in the process, um, the role is in the process. Uh, so, for example, people who manage physical collections um, sometimes uh, may not understand why they should be involved in conversations about digital preservation if they actually manage physical stuff, right? So, um, it's going to require um, a lot of explaining uh, and also explaining in a way that they understand um, with their own words um, and also how this is going to affect their uh, daily work, right? Um, sometimes uh, also because digital, it's, it's um, so intangible, uh, it's very hard for people to understand um, why we need to select the things that we want to preserve. Um, why can't we just save it all, right? Oh, it's all digital, let's just store it uh, somewhere. Um, so for people, because they don't understand uh, what, uh, digital technologies are, or, or digital files even, um, it's very hard to grasp um, the idea of uh, having the limitation uh, for storage. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that in, in a second. Um, and you also want some um, commitment from, from, your, from your leadership, right? So uh, this advocacy doesn't go, it goes both ways, right? So, um, to the leadership but, uh, and also to the other people who work um, you know, with users. So it's, like I said, include all the, um, all the, different, um, all the different people uh, or the different roles in the organization. Um, and another challenge related to this is that one thing is theory and another thing is practice. Uh, so we can set uh, policies uh, and documentation, I guess we can really sit and write a wonderful policy um, for a digital preservation uh, program. Uh, but if it's not uh, really tied uh, to whatever systems or um, activities we currently have, uh, it's not going to be successful. So uh, we need to come up with policies that are down to earth, uh, realistic and achievable. Uh, and we also have to try to um, build on existing practice. So um, try to fold into existing workflows and you know, think about how these policies will fit um, within existing practices. Um, and so uh, there is this um, reading here that we have suggested uh, that's related to um, this topic. It's called Document This and This and This Too. Uh, and this was written by Amy Russo. She's a senior consultant at ADP. Uh, and it's a really short 
uh, but super fun um, blog post about why you should document all your digital preservation practices. So I, I definitely recommend uh, you read it. We can go to the okay. Um, so another challenge is uh, assay uh, identification and data curation, because um, you need to select what you will be preserved. Right? Uh, there's no way you can save it all. Uh, you must prioritize your content. Right? Um, but that is that that sometimes making those decisions sometimes is hard, right? So sometimes because we have limited information about the assets that we have, um, sometimes because we don't have the right government. So who is making these decisions? Um, so it it can be a challenge for organizations to uh, agree on what kind of uh, information or kind of um, assets we will preserve for the long term. Um, sometimes you know. Uh, a solution for these can be uh, having this different uh, levels of preservation. There are organizations, um, I think, for example, Sound and Vision, uh, I'm pretty sure they have the, their digital preservation policy uh, public. Uh, so you can go to the site and see it. Uh, we will see that they have different uh, levels of preservation for di different types of assets. And so, uh, you know, for assets that are uh, more valuable, maybe you have. Um, tighter rules about how the digital preservation is um, achieved. Uh, and maybe for other assets, it's less so. Um, so that's, that's um, maybe something to consider. Um, and um, like I said, um, it's, it, the storage is not only about the terabytes. Um, it is also about maintenance, backups, routing checks, et cetera. So, um, when we're thinking about selecting the assets uh, that we're going to preserve in the long term, we need to think about all these things as well. So if we have multi many levels of uh, preservation for diff different assets, uh, then how is that going to impact our storage and therefore how that is going to impact our costs, right? So uh, you see that there's this uh, multiple level thing um, that we need to uh, think about. Um, but in order to select these assets, um, we, we need to know what we have. And sometimes that's the biggest challenge, right? Um, and not only in terms of the content, but also in terms of the technical information that we have. Um, and sometimes we can only guess what we have. Um, we don't have all the time in the world to describe every single asset, right? Um, so, um, so sometimes it's, it's it's good to make some assumptions if it, if if um, you know if it's if it's not realistic um, to describe all the all the assets. Of course, you need to uh, make some assumptions, and and that goes back again to governance, right? So who makes these decisions? Um, so like you see, everything is uh, tied together. Um, so we can go to the next one. Um, so. I was saying how hard it is to have information about your assets, right? So a challenge is definitely being able to capture and generate metadata. Um, and of course, metadata is important because uh, we want our assets to be discoverable. Um, and we also want to grab different types of metadata about our assets, right? So like I said, not only content, but also technical information that will help us determine um, the value of our collections, uh, but also monitor how, you know, how they behave in the long term if, if, if obsolescence is, a, is an issue that we need to think about, uh, et cetera. Right? Um, so ideally, you would describe everything, um, uh, or, or you would have a person describing your assets, right? Uh, so human-generated metadata is very accurate, but it is time-consuming, right? Um, so machines can help us get some of these metadata, right? So for the technical metadata, that may be a little uh, more straightforward, but for content metadata, that can be a little more, um, a little more complicated. Um, so we don't have to be afraid of using technologies, but we have to keep uh, the balance between um, you know, deciding, that, that's the issue, right? That's the challenge, deciding what's the balance between using 
uh, human um, generated metadata and also um, automated metadata, right? So, but the, the, the idea is that not, it's not one or the other, right? Um, how these two can be, can work together. So what can um, humans do better uh, and what can do machines better? Um, and so thinking about how they can work together um, to get good metadata about your collection. Um, so, oops, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so another challenge is um, maintaining consistency in the data structures and the output. So the data can be stored, migrated, and accessed easily. Um, so that requires a lot of planning. Um, so uh, of course, it, and this is also tied to selecting systems, right? How they how they all work within one environment, and also how your metadata uh, moves across all these different systems. Uh, so that requires a lot of time, um, and also planning. So you need to think ahead, um, and also sometimes accept that it's not possible to fully describe um, every single thing. Sometimes you uh, need to be able to let it go. Um, so moving to the next. Uh, another big challenge is um, migration. Um, so um, one one big thing that we need to think about um, when thinking about migration is that um, in the process, it's very likely that you'll lose something. Um, so there's gonna you're gonna have to accept some some form of loss in the process. So that could be, for example, specific metadata that doesn't map to specific um, to specific fields in another system. Uh, maybe some formats will not be um, compatible with another with other systems, etc. Uh, and also um, time, um, and and not not only time for planning your migrations because you need to think ahead and you need to uh, sort of have your head in the future, right? Uh, but also the process of migration takes a, a, a long time. So uh, it can be digital, maybe it's, a, it's very intangible, but bits are actually moving from one side to the other, right? So in that process takes time. Um, so migration can take time. Um, and another challenge related to this is uh, monitoring your collection. So um, uh, who is responsible for um, making sure that your assets are okay and uh, determining if they need migration either to another storage system or maybe migration to a different format, et cetera. So uh, that's, uh, that's also something to consider and definitely um, a challenge. You want to go to the next slide? Um, and finally, um, we think this is, this is a, um, uh, an important challenge that has not uh, been um, fully addressed, uh, although the community has made some progress in starting the conversation at least about uh, the environmental impact of long-term uh, digital preservation. Because um, it's, yeah, in, in order to preserve those bits, um, we need energy, we need computing power, um, but also thinking about you know when when we are disposing um, uh, materials you know if you deaccession some of your materials um, where do they go uh, is that environmentally safe um, so this is this is something that you know there aren't a lot of answers for um, but there is a, a suggested reading here um, that is that is really interesting toward environmental and sustainable digital preservation. Um, and that one focuses on um, high efficiency, so how, how we can get the most efficiency out of our um, technical systems uh, over high performance. So it's a trade-off between uh, performance and efficiency, um, and, but also proposes uh, the reevaluation of our archival processes in order to be more environmental friendly. Um, so um, I definitely encourage you to uh, read these um, paper. Um, yeah, uh, I think we can go to the next one. Yeah, okay, so another question. Um, 
uh, you asked us to talk about was what are the most useful skills digital curators are about to develop or that need to develop. And um, we both get asked this a lot. Um, and usually when people are asking this question, they want to know what are the technical skills that I need to learn to become a digital curator? And we get to that. Um, but uh, in our experience, uh, we both, you know, we talked about this and we both found that a lot of the skills that you are going to need to work in any area of digital preservation, whether it's as a digital preservation librarian or in any part of the, um, the life cycle of caring for digital assets, um, people skills are really, uh, I think, number one for uh, working in this field. Um, you know, as Pamela mentioned, um, digital preservation involves a lot of people in the organization that you're going to be working in. And so a lot of the job of digital preservation is educating people on digital preservation and why they have a role in it and what their role is and persuading them of the value of it. Um, you may find in your first job working um, as a digital curator that some organizations who, who don't ha haven't had that role before um, may think, well, I, we hired our digital curator and now we did it. We did digital preservation. They're gonna take care of it. Um, we don't have to think about it now. Um, and so sometimes you may, you know, come into a situation where you have to do a lot of education and you have to do a lot of um, network building um, and persuading people um, about um, how you're going to infuse the digital uh, and collection life cycle with um, preservation planning. So um, a good way to to start doing this is to start building up your skills um, in just talking about digital preservation. So you're going to learn, or maybe you have learned um, a lot of technical um, information about preservation, um, but you'll have to start thinking about who your audiences are and learn how to talk about this without jargon. So um, practicing on your family or your friends outside of library school is a good way um, to develop these skills in talking about um, digital preservation. Um, I, we call it the elevator pitch here, but you know, having a very brief and concise um, statement of what you do and why you do it, or why digital preservation is important, is good to just have on hand. Um, so yeah, just being able to talk about it in a way that um, people can understand, but also doesn't make them feel uh, that they're being talked down to. Um, so something that you will also encounter um, in institutions that haven't had a uh, digital uh, preservation or much of a digital program at all is um, you'll find people that are being introduced to these ideas for the first time, or they may um, feel a little self-conscious or insecure about their own abilities um, and their own um, knowledge of uh, digital in general and may not be ready to um, hear new ideas from the new person in the organization. Um, so I think, you know, learning how to be patient and respectful um, with people, uh, we call that a soft skill, uh, but I think it's a very important skill to have. Um, just really building up, you know, a resilience to push back as well um, as you're coming into this. Um, and just learning to how to be respectful when you do encounter any kind of disagreement or conflict around the work that you're about to do. Um, in addition to being patient and respectful though, also learning how to negotiate or learn how to come to compromise with people is a very important skill. Um, so you may have a grand idea for how you want to implement a digital preservation strategy at your organization, um, but you may get pushback and you may find that, you know, after listening um, to other people's concerns that you may need to compromise. So, you know, thinking about that at the outset that, um, you're going to need to come to a place with all parties, all stakeholders involved, um, where everybody feels like they benefit and everybody feels um, like they're happy with the outcome. So thinking ahead about how you're going to negotiate and come to a good compromise for everyone involved is good for people to get ahead. And finally, just you know, learning how to run a good meeting really goes a long way. So you're going to find yourself in a room 
with people making decisions about, say, governance or policy or things that aren't technical at all um, or things that are technical. But um, in order to get things done, I think learning how to um, have an agenda, um, have people participate, um, how to invite ideas and feedback from people who might not feel comfortable offering them, especially if they you know, feel like they don't know as much about digital preservation as you do. Um, and thinking about who should be at the table. Um, not everyone knows that they may have a stake in digital preservation, but they, their role, um, we see that their role um, does um, support this. And so thinking about who's, who's, whose voice isn't present and really going out and seeking those people out and inviting um, their, their input um, on that whole process. So related to that, oops, um, learning how to navigate change management um, is very closely related. Um, as I said, you know, change can be very hard for organizations, um, especially if they don't have digital preservation governance or policy or technology in place. So, you know, an organization might say they want to implement a digital preservation program, but they might not be ready for it. <clears throat> Um, or they might not know what it entails. So they may think that this is just a technical problem and we have a, we hired a technical person to uh, implement a technical solution. So again, you know, having your elevator pitch, but also learning how to communicate a vision with broad goals and clearly defined benefits. So learning how you can articulate the positive impacts of a good digital preservation strategy and having that at the ready. Um, it's good to learn how to, uh, both, you know, just listen to stakeholders and colleagues at your organization, but also get to know your organization's mission. Um, if they have a strategic plan um, and learning how you can tie your preservation strategy to these organizations' goals and their purpose. Um, this is also um, a good skill to do if you're searching for a job. Um, if you want to get a sense of um, how well your organization, um, the organization that you're applying to, um, how well or, or ready they are to adopt a uh, digital preservation strategy uh, before you get into the job. Um, I think looking at their mission and strategic plan to see if they even mention that or if they have an understanding um, of uh, digital preservation uh, is a, a good thing to do. Um, we have uh, a couple of posts here by our colleague, uh, Kara Van Malsen, where she talks about um, the challenges of change in organizations and also the, the human side of technology. Um, one thing that we do here at ABP is we um, like to um, use what's called a human-centered design framework with some of our projects um, where uh, you can Google this, or there's a company called, organization called IDEO that also has a lot of training resources on human-centered design. But it's basically starting by doing a discovery phase um, when you're on the outset of a, a new digital project and really getting a sense of what are the human needs and the human problems and um, shaping um, your discovery and your uh, development, project development around those, those human needs and um, yeah, so there's a lot of great ideas for how to get people involved in that. So I'd highly recommend that. Uh, Kira mentions it in these um, two, two articles here, these two blog posts. Um, so I highly recommend. We're getting to the technical stuff, I promise, if that's what you came for. But uh, project management also uh, high up there on the, the skills that you'll need for digital preservation. So again, you know, having the ability to talk to different groups, um, being able to um, clearly define the roles um, in a project. Uh, what is the scope of the project? What is out of scope in a project? Um, being able to set deadlines and then working with people to ensure that those deadlines are, are met, so ensuring that the work gets done. Um, a lot of uh, digital preservation you know, might involve working with a, either an in-house software team or um, working with a vendor or working with um, an outsourced software development team to build or implement a solution. Um, and you will probably find that you are the person in charge of making sure that that 
to go smoothly and that that happens on time. So whether or not you're managing that project team in-house or you're kind of managing it um, both in-house and, and with um, outsourced um, help, um, being able to have either have a defined project management framework or having good tools to make sure that uh, everybody can stay on track is a very good skill to work on. Um, one, uh, if you are working with um, an in-house software development team, I think understanding the software development lifecycle um, is very important. So understanding um, how, how that works, uh, either when it's at a library or outside of libraries. Um, a very popular framework that is used in software development is called the Agile framework. Um, that's something that we use here within AVP, and it's something that I've worked with at a number of libraries. Um, but you can go online and find resources about how Agile works. There are very um, defined roles um, in that. And so if you are using Agile at one organization and you learn how it works, you may be able to go to another organization. And if they say they're using Agile, um, supposedly you should be able to just fit right in and understand how the, the rhythms and flow of that work goes. Okay, so having some familiarity with cloud technologies is becoming increasingly important um, as we're moving a lot of our, our storage um, to the cloud. Um, so a lot of the digital pre uh, preservation and curation services are happening in using cloud services such as Amazon's AWS um, or other, other services like that. So um, even if you, aren't able to get any uh, practical experience in there, just setting up a free account and reading and playing around and trying to understand how they work, looking at the dashboard, um, seeing what features are available, um, learning how billing works. So like looking at billing profiles and you know, getting a sense of how um, you're, you're going to start planning for um, managing costs over time. So you know, getting a sense for how, how cloud technologies work, but also how the interfaces work and um, how permissions work, how access controls work within those, those systems. Um, one thing we have on the, our website that is a little bit dated, we're in the process of updating them now, but we have um, a uh, introduction to um, cloud uh, services, cloud storage services. Um, and we also have uh, profiles for a number of different offerings that are out there that would be slightly out of date, but they'll give you a sense of what are um, the things you need to think about when you're looking at uh, potential um, cloud services for um, your own uh, storage choice. So yeah, all the other technologies that you'll need to learn for digital uh, preservation or curation. Um, I think number one there is just getting comfortable on the command line. So um, you don't need to know everything right away, but um, you should at least be comfortable learning on the command line. So learning some basic things, just like how to create files, how to name files, how to create directories, moving things back and forth, um, getting some level of familiarity. And then when you're actually faced with a problem, being able to like read up on what tools are available. There's so much you can do on the command line. Um, that uh, if you are faced with a problem, you should check and see, is there a way I can do this on the command line? Um, you'll learn the right tools when you, when you need them. But I think just approaching it, there's a lot of people who see a you know, black terminal screen and the blinking cursor and they think, I can't, I can't do this. Someone needs to write a script for me to do this. But I encourage you to just really embrace those fears and see that it's not, it's not that scary and it can even be a little bit fun. Um, I think, um, I personally think that uh, learning databases is an important skill to have. I, I talked to a, another library school class uh, last night um, about databases as a digital literacy course, and um, we talked about how relational databases work and talked about query languages for that. So even if you're not the one building a system or the one implementing a system, You'll probably have access to the database backend. There's always a database attached to every digital asset management or digital preservation system. Um, and you know, there may be an interface for reports 
or uh, just managing certain operations, but usually they're not going to give you everything that you need. And you may find that you need to either access the database um, to generate certain data or certain reports. You may need it to um, audit uh, the metadata that you have. You may need it to find very specific pieces of information or update certain pieces of information. So I think, you know, at least getting a sense for how data databases work, if not learning a little bit about how to interact with them is a very important uh, tool for, for digital preservation. And there's much more that I think Anthony mentioned uh, a few at the, the start, you know, just, just learning how computers work, learning how networks work, learning how we, we transfer files um, both across local networks and across um, the internet um, are all, you know, very valuable core, uh, core uh, uh, pr proficiencies um, for learning about uh, technology. Uh, learning how to evaluate uh, solutions. So learning how to evaluate both proprietary and open source um, solutions. So you may be asked to help evaluate and select a digital preservation management system. Um, and uh, it's very easy to um, look out there in, at the landscape and see what's popular, which may be something open source, it may be something from a vendor. Um, but really a lot of the job is assessing the needs and requirements of your own organization um, and then being able to evaluate those solutions and how they meet your needs. Uh, so learning how to define business requirements for your institution um, is a good skill to, skill to learn. Um, there's a lot out there on you know, how to do this very formally. Um, we do have um, an example of something that we did for uh, Yale developing their digital preservation system requirements um, as a reference for you, but really learning how to articulate down to like very specific levels of detail what you're going to be needing for your system. And this also involves people skills because to learn about your needs, you're gonna to need to talk to a very uh, wide range of stakeholders at your institution. And so have that ready before you start looking at the technology rather than looking at the technology and letting that guide what you need or what you think you need. And then finally related to that, um, you know, learning, getting familiar with how to, how to budget and how to do cost analysis. Um, a lot, as Pamela mentioned, a lot of digital preservation is planning for the long term. And a lot of this is um, generating cost estimates of how much it's going to cost you to store data over time. Um, you may be asked by administration, well, how much is this going to cost us? And you may need, or you may not be asked and you may need to um, come to your uh, governance group, you know, who, who may not have uh, familiarity with how much it costs um, to store things. And you may have to come to them with a very, very large cost estimate and say, hey, look, we can't save everything. Um, this is what it's going to cost us. And um, that can be upsetting for some people who don't wanna be faced with the realities of, of storage costs, but um, learning how to make those estimates and be able to um, bring that um, reality, I guess, uh, to the table is a very important skill to have. Um, I guess, yeah, and I guess in addition to, to um, learning how much the storage is gonna cost is um, thinking about the cost of staffing um, as well. So learning how to build other uh, indirect costs uh, into digital preservation, um, which um, may not be something you can easily learn before you start a job, but once you're on the job, I think really getting a sense for what all goes into digital preservation and what is the larger cost besides just the storage. Um, you know, what is gonna cost to, to make this uh, program sustainable over time, which involves people, um, technology, hardware, um, and all of that. Okay, so the, the last question that we have um, to talk about today is um, how to introduce new trends in preservation technologies to rather conservative memory institutions if there's an apparent lack of technical know-how. Uh, and we touched a little bit on some of this already in um, some of our discussions in the earlier questions. Um, 
but we'll, um, it, it can be difficult, but we've got a few, a few ideas here. So I think most important for me is building relationships and listening. So it's one thing that I found that that's really been valuable to me um, in all of my jobs is to start by building relationships before you need something from people. So you're going to need to be working with people eventually, and it, it may not be evident, you know, exactly who you're going to be making asks to at the start. So really on your first day, you know, day one, really think about who are the people that I'm going to need on my side um, as I want to implement this digital preservation program. Um, so one thing that I've done in previous jobs um, was, you know, as I meet people, just start setting up a monthly coffee on the calendar um, before you even know that you need to talk about digital preservation with them. Um, and this is really easy to do, I think, when you're just starting a job because, you know, people are usually very eager to help new staff um, get comfortable and get off to a good start. So people are usually like, sure, I'll go to coffee with you. Um, so yeah, put that on your calendar and make it a recurring appointment. Um, but yeah, it's also just good to, you know, get to know people at a new, a new, a new job, a new environment. Um, but you'll find that, you know, if you already have a good working relationship with, with people and even, you know, a good, just like collegial and just like friendly relationship with people, like once you start building that trust, when you, it comes time to talk to them about um, help supporting your digital preservation uh, strategy, uh, you'll find it's much easier to get help and buy in from those folks and the folks that they know. So start building your network right away. Um, a lot of times um, you will get pushback when you try to present your ideas, but don't go in assuming um, that people who are asking questions or who are expressing skepticism um, about your ideas that they know less than you. Um, they might have a lot of good reasons and they, you know, especially if they've been at the institution for a very long time, um, they might have reasons for being skeptical. You know, they may have had three pre digital preservation librarians before you who came in and tried to implement something and then left a year later. Um, they may have um, had a vendor who, you know, help them implement a solution that really didn't work out. Um, so people, the, I feel like the longer that people have been in an organization, the more seasoned and savvy they are um, to how they need to maintain a, a sustainable uh, level um, uh, for their organization. And sometimes that means being very skeptical of new ideas. So I think, you know, just start out by listening um, learn the local situation and environment before you start bringing ideas to people. Um, and understand that people need to express their concerns. They sometimes just need to get this out there and know that you've heard them before they're willing to receive any new ideas. And I guess on the flip side of that too, it's worth mentioning that there are times when people are way too enthusiastic about adopting new ideas. And you know, then it becomes about you know, like managing expectations and, you know, being people, you know, tempered enough so that they don't just like buy the newest technology and then never use it. So being aware of both sides, important. Um, so um, and another idea uh, to bring in, um, uh, you know, new new trends in digital preservation at organizations that um, are just getting started or don't know much about that um, is gathering information. Um, but this means, and th we mean these uh, in the sense of gathering information from the outside, so external information that will help you uh, make the case internally. Um, so for example, uh, finding um, what peer institutions are doing. Um, and um, maybe asking um, within your organization who they think their peer organizations are, because you may have a different uh, idea of who they are. Um, and so um, collecting information from these organizations, uh, uh, any type of documentation that they may have uh, published, um, maybe uh, setting up interviews with them, um, and talking to them directly. Uh, maybe site visits or some sort of interaction with them. Um, so you actually see what they're doing. 
Um, but it could be also that um, maybe uh, the organizations that are considered uh, or you consider your peers uh, are not doing a great job or are stuck. Uh, and so maybe they are not a, a good example. Um, so uh, maybe in that case, uh, a good idea would be um, to ask within your organization uh, who we, are, we aspire to be. Um, so maybe not thinking about who our peers are, but maybe where we want to go and then finding organizations that are at that stage and uh, organizations that we look up to uh, and maybe using them as an example. Um, so uh, an idea um, to do this uh, would be, for example, um, using uh, some sort of information that is provided by a major organization, a major organization like, for example, a disease preservation plan um, available. Um, and so maybe uh, creating a draft or mocking up a draft of the same plan, but sort of tailored to your own organization and, and, and sort of pointing to that organization saying, um, so in, in a way that is, you can, you can show that it's scalable. Um, so you can say, for example, this organization has this digitization plan, uh, but, but we have created this digitization plan that is an adaptation from that. Uh, it's a little, it's, you know, smaller and maybe um, considering all our uh, internal restrictions and limitations, uh, but you can also point to how you can get to that uh, bigger, um, to that bigger stage, right? So uh, you start using their documentation and then you know, uh, creating pathways um, to um, uh, getting to that stage, right? Um, so that's that's another an, another way of uh, sort of connecting your reality with organizations that may uh, be one step further uh, on the road. Um, very generally, uh, pointing, uh, pointing to best practices at places that uh, your organization looks up to. Um, and also, like I said, uh, showing how they scale to your own uh, operations. Uh, another uh, idea for collecting information is uh, gathering data uh, on costs and expenses and cost savings, expenses, et cetera, uh, including staff hours, um, new technologies, techniques, um, things that are you are currently using, but also things that you're not currently using. So just gathering um, information uh, and um, you know, analyzing that information, showing it in a way that uh, it's digestible. Um, so like pie charts or you know, graphics and, um, so you can provide, um, uh, you know, visuals uh, and, and you know, information in a way that is uh, easily understandable by um, people in your organization. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Also, um, examples of laws are really great. Um, so if you can find examples out there of things that are not working or, or where something went wrong. Um, of course, it's not a very it's not a very positive uh, thing, but uh, you know, like pointing to the type of things that could happen to your organization if you don't do uh, a a B and C, right? Um, so, uh, and also maybe showing them um, the money that they are losing because they are not doing something. So, uh, you know, you are investing in um, I don't know your physical collections, right? Or you're investing in digitization, um, then if you're not investing in digital preservation, that, then that invest, investment becomes a loss, right? Um, so uh, how showing, showing or pointing to um, the areas where uh, investment is being lost um, because you're not doing something. Um, and so uh, related to that, there is this uh, useful tool uh, that we built, it's called uh, cost of inaction calculator. Um, so this tool is specific is specific for um, physical audiovisual collections, but um, if you use it, uh, it gives you an idea of how much money uh, you are losing or how much investment you're losing if you are not uh, digitizing your collections, right? So if you're just leaving your physical collections uh, in the vault. So you're already investing money uh, in keeping those uh, physical assets safe, 
uh, I don't know, temperature control or, you know, in your vaults, but if you're not digitizing them, uh, then what's the, the, the loss, right? Um, so although it's specifically for physical collections, I, uh, I think it's a, it's a good idea uh, to take a look at that and maybe um, follow the same model um, in other areas. Um, and so um, also, and I said this a little bit, but also giving examples of um, uh, organizations that have actually uh, lost uh, collections and sort of analyzing that, um, you know, not just saying that they lost uh, part of their collections, but uh, sort of tying that to digital preservation, right? Uh, so for example, um, I don't know if you heard of the issue with MySpace that they lost a bunch of information. So uh, maybe giving that as an example and say, well, if they had done this, this, and this, maybe this wouldn't have happened, right? So uh, it's, it's a good example because people are familiar with these um, uh, organizations or these platforms. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it gets, uh, gets them a little bit more connected to um, the problems that could happen. Uh, and maybe also pointing to specific disasters, like natural disasters that uh, created um, uh, loss uh, in, in different ways. Um, so if you can find examples of that, uh, that's, that's also a good way uh, of showing what you could lose if you don't act um, in your organization. Okay, and uh, one more, one more tactic we have here um, is pilot projects or building prototypes. Um, so implementing, you know, say a digital asset management system or a digital preservation system or a whole new, say, digitization workflow. Um, a lot of things can seem very big and scary to administrators and, you know, rightfully so. They usually involve a lot of cost, a lot of planning, a lot of people. Um, but it's, it's sometimes easier to suggest that you pilot something or do a very scaled down version for the purpose of learning something um, that will help you decide whether or not you want to implement that system or workflow in production. Um, so it's usually easier to get administrators approval to pilot something, um, you know, something because it's, it's lower cost and lower commitment um, before you actually make a big ask for um, moving to a larger system. Um, it's very important um, with this to define at the outset what you want to learn from the pilot project. So, you know, think about why you're doing this. Are, are you wanting to learn about cost? Are you wanting to learn about um, staff efficiency? Are you wanting to learn um, about the system, um, the system requirements, um, how well the system integrates uh, with your, your existing systems? So really define what you want to learn from this pilot um, and make sure that you set a timeline for it. So set, be able to set, set a short timeline for it so it really is low cost, it has a beginning and an end, and you can say to your administrators, we will have you know, the results of our pilot um, by this date. Um, and then you come back to them and say, look how this worked. Or you might learn, look, that this didn't work and you know, this has really changed how I thought about how we want to approach this project. Um, we've worked with a few different um, clients um, implementing pro uh, pilots or, or prototypes. And um, one we've done recently was doing something very innovative, working with um, a university that wanted to um, do speech to text and named entity recognition for uh, the preservation and access of uh, one of their audio collections. And um, so that was something that they received initial funding from, from the administration, so they could test the viability of it. Um, and now we've helped them with that. They're able to assess that on their own. They've implemented it locally, and now they're gonna be taking that report back to their administration to show them what worked, what didn't, and how they want to go forward with that. Um, something too, I'm not sure what funding situations are like, um, in Europe, but certainly there are a lot of uh, large and small grants that uh, libraries can pursue in the United States um, that are dedicated to planning or to piloting um, uh, certain projects. And so that's something, if you're able to work with your administrators to get external funding to plan or pilot a solution, um, that is also, I think, that also takes a lot of the burden off the organization if they know that they're going to get 
um, some support for this and they don't have to find room in the budget to support that, that pilot. Um, but yeah, your mileage may vary depending on where you live and what uh, funding opportunities you have available to you. Um, but yeah, that is what we have for um, our answers to your questions. Um, maybe we've um, inspired new questions um, with you right now. So I think we have a few minutes left and we're happy to take any other questions if you have any. Okay, um, can I just get a show of hands for any questions? And well, first of all, can I get a round of applause? <laughs> So, uh, anything stimulated by that? Any area? Okay, uh, I'll ask one myself. So, uh, an easy one to begin with. What's your elevator pitch for digital preservation? Uh, you said you have I, one. I don't have my elevator pitch for digital preservation. I have my elevator pitch for my data. <laughs> um, then specifically digital preservation is in. Um, Can you come up with one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pamela, do you have one that you use? I don't. You're out of guard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought that might happen. We haven't had to use it in a while. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what I've used. I, I think that um, usually when I when I think about digital preservation and I try to explain it, it's it's a lot about um, how you'll be able to access the content in the future. So it's not about how cool it is to have your data stored forever, um, but how you will be able to access it forever. So oh, what do you do digital preservation? What does that mean? Well, it means that you know, hundred years from now. If you do it correctly, uh, you'll be able to provide access to the content that um, you are creating today. Uh, and so it's, it's usually um, uh, mostly tied to access. So people can understand that uh, more than they can understand storage and caring for bits, you know? Yeah, yeah certainly if the pitch is to administrators, being able to, you know, give them immediately, like, these are the benefits to you, and it's usually access, and here's how we're going to save you money on staff costs and increase efficiency. <laughs> okay, well, you got there. Um, another one was more about, you're talking about C, uh, command line interfaces and databases, and um, where can a, uh, where can someone find a way of learning those things outside of their studies? but perhaps in, in line with their studies, such as librarians and so on? Mm. There are, um, I mean, you know, there are a lot of online um, courses like Codecademy and a lot of free um, software courses that offer database um, courses. And some of these do have interactive um, uh, SQL uh, uh, query interfaces. Um, one we used last night in the class was, uh, it was called, it wasn't a course, but it was an actual like interactive SQL interface where you could write actual queries against um, small databases. It's called uh, data sets, uh, D-A-T-A-S-E-T-T-E-S, -T 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 -E um, which just has a lot of um, public data from very random organizations. Um, that was one that, we were looking at last night, but there, it is tough because usually within a library school education, you have somebody hosting something on a local server, and so you you do have to find access to that. But there are there are free courses out there that have um, interactive components to them. Yeah, um, I, I use Codecademy quite a lot at my my classes. Uh, it's really it's really user-friendly, uh, and it's really interactive. So they do have, yeah, some of their courses are free. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions yet <laughs> from the audience? Try one. 
Chesky. Here we go. Hello, uh, I want to ask, uh, our scientists are not used to uh, site data collections. Uh, how to measure uh, the use of scientific data in our repository? Do you have some idea how, how to measure? And for example, not to use Google Analytics. Uh, use of scientific data in a repository. Uh, so so uh, we, we need uh, some measurement uh, of uh, uh, how our repository is used by scientists, and uh, we don't want to use Google Analytics. So, is there another measurement tools? Uh, I don't know some uh, altmetrics or something like this. Uh, not just downloads, but but if, if we are interested in the user user needs and user requirements, uh, and uh, we need to have some evidence that our uh, repository is used by uh, scientists out outside of university, for example. Um, yeah, that is tough because I know that if you if you have I know that some like vended solutions for, for data repositories offer those those types of analytics. I'm not sure about what other uh, say open source or other vendors for for measuring those on website use. I would be on Google Analytics, but it is hard to find out what happens to your data once it leaves your your website and how people use that in the wild, and I don't have a good answer for that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, one more question. Niegdo? No. Um, OK, give me one second. I just need to read over my notes. Um, so I have an option here. So. You talk a lot about pushbacks, and um, I was wondering if there would be any particular cases that were incredibly difficult, or um, working with vendors. Uh, is that something is something that seems to be growing a lot, that an institution is turning to vendors more than to doing things in-house? Is that true, or uh, is it favorable to work for, with a vendor to do your digitization? So, there's two questions. I, sometimes it has to do with the budget and how institutions allocate their budget because the vendor solution, um, it's usually, it's sometimes easier to find the money in the budget to purchase um, a vendor solution than it is to allocate money to staffing. Because if you do things in-house, you're usually gonna have to create new, new roles and that is, at least in the US, it's, it's more difficult to create new roles, um, to commit uh, budget lines to, to people, um, rather than having just like this annual budget to buy things. Um, but on the practical side of that too, um, I think definitely a lot of seasoned administrators, you know, have a view of turnover and change within their libraries and sometimes see vendor solutions as being more sustainable and easy to manage over time. Um, sometimes this depends on where you live and how able you are to um, staff the positions that you need to support, support open source. And sometimes it's just a matter of um, leadership and being able to retain the staff that you need to support, support open source. Um, I, I think also the, uh, the other thing to consider with um, external vendors is that um, you still need to manage those projects. So you still require staff time. Uh, someone needs to be in charge of that, no matter what that project is. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're thinking about costs, that's also something uh, to, to consider. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Um, that was all very interesting to me. <laughs> and uh, again, can we just get a round of applause? And uh, thank you for your time.
both Sean and Pamela. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess that's us for the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.